and their team. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And I've told you a few weeks ago that I just wanted to do a thing every once in a while, and I guess we just would call it to get informed. And I just want to kind of let you know, and then we'll move on to tonight's sermon, but uh, kind of where we are and the things that are going on in our world. And uh, thank you for coming to church. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for coming this morning. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, you can tell that Easter is, is over, uh, but uh, Jesus is still alive. And uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting Sister Alice Nolan. Um, I'll tell you that what she said today was a literal word from God. That may be a problem there. What she had to say today, if you weren't here and you missed it, Go back, or if you'll come see me, I'll make sure you get a free copy of the DVD or something of what she said today. But she could not have put her finger more on, on a word from God for our church than she did today. And uh, so I appreciate, I appreciate folks that will come and have a word from, from the Lord for us. So this afternoon, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through 14, the Bible said, Then Jesus went out. And departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming. And at the end of the age, verse 4, the Bible said, And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will be deceived, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Many, it didn't say, listen, it doesn't say many out there will be offended. It's talking about a blanket. Every many will be offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise, rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Pastor, where are we? What's going on in the world? I just read it to you. Everything I just read to you is happening right in front of you. The end is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is coming back. So you've got to get informed. And you've got to pay attention to where we are in time. This isn't my sermon tonight. This is just a little commercial, and I'll be on it. It's laying right there. Uh, this is for you to be informed. So I hope you watch the news. Everything I just read to you on April the 24th, 2019, this, this past week, if you're watching the news and you know what's going on, Russia just launched its what they call its doomsday submarine this past week. The submarine that they just launched this week is supposedly the largest submarine in the world. It carries drones that are called uh, the Poseidon drones. I'll read to you in just a second. They're called Poseidon drones. This submarine will hit the water this coming week. It has drones, nuclear drones, that are large enough to be launched in the sea to cause tsunami tidal waves on any coast that touches the United States. Wars and rumors of wars. Well, I'm not gonna read it to you. Sri Lanka, last week, over 300 now, 350 people killed. 
for going to a worship service on Easter. The Bible said, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Just this afternoon before going to the board meeting, I sat down and watched the news for a few moments. In California, you know, just in the past couple of days, there's been another synagogue shooting, another demonstration of hate that's being shown towards people's beliefs. In the news this afternoon, I just saw this a few minutes ago. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but in the California shooting in the synagogue that just happened, a surgeon, doctor in the hospital is doing CPR on a lady that he looks down and realizes is his wife that was shot in the synagogue. You saw the news? He was doing CPR on a lady that he didn't think he knew. She's so covered with blood, so shot up because she jumped in front of the rabbi to save his life. She jumps in front of him to save the rabbi's life. It saved the rabbi's life. She's dead and her husband's doing CPR on her. They will deliver you up and kill you and will hate you, will be hated by all nations for my namesake. The United Methodists, this past week, April the 20th, 2019, the United Methodists edge more and more towards a breakup over their LGBT policies. The vote in their church, mind you, was 438 to 384, basically almost split right down the middle not being able to decide whether we let pastors that are gay one of the front runners for president has now decided that terrorists can vote on your future do y'all watch the news or you just don't well, y'all don't want to talk about this kind of stuff I just read to you what's going on in the world. We want to know how close we are to the coming of Jesus Christ and it's happening right in front of us. It's happening while I'm talking to you. We've decided now, or someone I have not decided, that it's okay for the Boston Marathon bomber and sexual assaulters to decide the future of our country. I say no. The Bible said, verse 10, and then many will be offended. I don't really think they ought to go back and rewrite that and put millions ought to be offended. <laughs> the California State Campus this week on April the 26th ditched their mascot of their college campus, Prospector Pete was their mascot was placed there in 1940 as their mascot, has been ever since, and now after complaints from the students that this mascot hurts people's feelings, they tear the mascot down and move him off somewhere else, and now the mascot that they're gonna have for their college campus is just gonna be called the beach because it's not that offensive. At some point, breathing is going to become offensive. I guess it already has. We kill babies as soon as they're born. And many shall be offended. You want to know? You need to get informed. Exactly what I just read to you from the Word of God is happening right in front of us. Who would we bring to church this morning? Who'd we bring to church this afternoon? Who'd we bring to church with us to tell them and to show them what's coming down the road? I just wonder, are we informed? Turn with me if you have a Bible and let's preach a little while. Would you rather have that happen? <laughs> I appear so. In 2 Samuel chapter 23. And tonight I want to continue on again from talking to you about dreams, chasing your dream, 
and the pursuit of the things of God in your life. I hope this is helping you on Sunday nights. I'll just pray for me. I'll get over this in a little bit and we'll move on to something else. We'll talk about something else. But I want to talk about, I want to talk to dreamers. I want to talk to people that still have a passion for the things of God and are pursuing despite what's going on in our world today. Listen, all that is true. All that's coming to pass. I just read it to you, but that doesn't mean we ought to hit autopilot. That does not mean we hit cruise control. That does mean, not mean that we just sit back and stop and let things idly go by. What it means is that the church ought to wake up and ramp up. All the Sunday night crowd, you have to help me. So I want to take a few, again, quotes from this book and and uh, that we've been reading. I hope you've been reading, and if not, you ought to go get it. The book's called Chase the Lion, and so some things I'll say tonight, some things are not my things. I wish I would have said them, but I didn't say them. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8 through 10, here is what you've got to focus on tonight to be able to get the point of what I'm saying, but tonight I just want to talk to you about decisive moments. For everybody in this room, there is a decisive moment. You must be a person of decision. At some point, you've got to make a decision for yourself. At some point, you've got to make a decision for your family. At some point, we've got to make a decision for our community and our church. At some point, with all the things we just, somebody's got to make a decision. And so there are decisive moments in your life. And some of those decisive moments are very, very brief opportunities that change the course of a generation or change the course of families. How many in a decisive moment have decided, I'm not going back to church? Look around. How many have decided in, in, a, in a brief second, and I'm talking at times milliseconds, of time and a decisive moment has affected. How many of you, probably everybody in this room would say, boy, I'd like to have that time back. Two people. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse eight through 10, the Bible said, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheth is there, his name. He was the Tekamonite. He was the chief, of the, uh, chief among the captains. He was also, the Bible said, called Adino the Esnite, and Esnite means gift of God. This man is a gift of God to David. The Bible said, why? Because he had killed 800 men at one time. I would say he's a gift from God. <laughs> if you're the king and there's enemies and one man can kill 800 devils at one time, that man's a gift from God. Amen. And the Bible said then on in verse 9, and after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. <laughs> now, how would you like to be? <laughs> the Bible said that he was a, a whole night. Boy, I wish they'd have given him a whole lot better names like mine and yours, like Bill, John, and Sue. It'd be a whole lot easier for me to pronounce. And the Bible said that he was one of three mighty men with David and they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. You understand that Israel's there? These have killed, one man has killed 800 men and the Bible said that the men of Israel have run off. They were scaredy cats. They've run off. They're gone. Verse 10. He arose, talking about Eleazar, he arose and attacked the Philistines. Listen to what the Bible said. We'll show this here at the very end. That the Philistines, he attacked the Philistines. One man, Eleazar, attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. 
I want to talk to you about decisive moments tonight for a few minutes. Lord, help me over the next few minutes to say what you would have me to say. But more importantly, Lord, let it fall on ears that want to hear. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. The Philistines, he attacked, Eleazar attacked the Philistines, the Bible said, until his hand was weary. He's got a sword in his hand. All of the church, all of Israel has retreated. They're gone. One man there has killed 800 guys. There's another man, Eleazar, here, and he's fighting. The Bible says he's fighting until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord, the Bible said the Lord brought about a great victory that day. So let's talk about it just for a minute and we'll close with what I just started with. These are verses, these verses I just read to you tell of the exploits of David's mighty men. It tells of the men that stuck with David. It tells of the men that stayed with him. Everybody else has retreated, but these guys, the Bible said there were two groups, one called the three and one called the 30. I just read to you about some of the three. Actually, when you go back and study the list of the 30, there are actually 37 of them because some of them died and were replaced. But these two groups are the mighty men of David that stuck with him through thick and through thin. To become a member of such a group during this time, a man had to show unparalleled courage in battle as well as wisdom in leadership. In order to become a part of this elite fighting group, in order to be listed in the three or in the 37 or the 30, the list of 30 the Bible says, each man had to show an unparalleled courage. I wonder where courage is today in our world. I wonder where courage is today to stand up against the things that are happening in our world today. I wonder, the Bible said we know where the courage was in a lot of them because the Bible said they had retreated. The Bible said they retreated. They did not have the courage to stand there. So one man, two, I just read to you, one man has the courage to stand there and fight or to kill 800 men. Another man has stood there with the sword until his wrist, the Bible said, is weary and his hand stuck to the sword. I want to talk to people that have some stick to that come hell or high water, no matter what everybody else is voting on, no matter what else is going on. I want to talk to people that will say, God saved me. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. It's too late for me to turn back now. There is no retreat. Some of you need to take retreat out of your vocabulary because, honey, we're not going backward. We're going forward. The rest of them have retreated. These guys had something about them. You know, at some point in your walk, at some point in your life, you're going to have to find, you've got to find that button on the inside of you. Because listen, all of us want to quit. There's been days we've wanted to give up. There's been days we've wanted to stop. But you've got to find that button on the inside of you that you can punch to say, no matter, am I preaching to you? No matter what happens, no matter what these guys found that button in order to be a part of it. You had to have courage. I wonder where, I wonder where the men of the church are today. The Bible said here that they had that they had retreated. They had to have wisdom in leadership. In order to grow a church today, in order to grow your family today, listen, sir, listen, ma'am, if you don't know what gift to pray for, you better be praying for wisdom. Solomon, the Bible said, could have asked for anything. The Lord said you asked for the most important thing, which was wisdom. Today, you don't need another check. Today, we don't need another program. Today, we don't need another cook-off. Today, what we need is the wisdom of God on how to grow a church and, Lord, lead us into the place. Give me the wisdom. You can't 
get it up there on the hill no. talking about at Fayetteville. No. You can't get wisdom. There is wisdom in education, yes, but I need to know, God, I need a gift of wisdom. I need to know what is the right thing to do in the middle of a wrongdoing world. And I need wisdom. I need the courage. I'm trying to get somewhere tonight. I need the courage to do it. Where's the courage to stand up and tell the truth anymore? Where's the courage to stand up for what's right anymore? And Lord, give me the wisdom to do it. I need wisdom to lead my family. Listen, I need wisdom to stay married. Come on, let's laugh for a minute because you may not laugh here in a minute. Come on, I know some of you. You need wisdom <laughs> to stay married. You watch the news. I just saw on the news. Uh, uh, you know, if you'd quit supporting Hollywood, Hollywood might shut up. Hmm. I went, would to God I had half the money that this theater just got down here in the past three days. Oh, now I'm offending some of you. Talk about Jesus and all that. We can get out and talk about it some superheroes. I'll tell you what, if you'd quit paying them, they'd shut up because they wouldn't have any money to have a platform or a voice. Pastor, your own daughter went to that movie. I know. <laughs> Just going to cut off the hypocritical folks right there. did not go over well. <laughs> it was extra anyway, because I didn't even, it wasn't even on here. <laughs> there are moments in life when chasing your dream that decisions must be made. If you're gonna chase your dream, there's gonna have to be decisions that are gonna be made, good and bad. If I want to see the dream come to pass in my life, there are some things that I'm going to have to face that are both really good and some things that are both really bad, and I must be willing to pay the price for both. There are moments when chasing that dream that I've got to make a decision, and what happens is most of the time we let everybody else make the decision for us. You can't do that. You can't become that. You can't do this, you can't do that. And in that very decisive moment, just like Pastor Alice spoke about today, I have allowed someone to dictate my future. Well, listen, I've come to the point in life that I'm no longer allowing people to dictate my future. If God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side and no weapon formed against me shall prosper, that means that all of heaven is voting for me, is voting for you tonight. Stop letting blind people tell you about your future. Stop letting blind people tell you about your future. Stop letting blind people tell you about your future. You can't do that. You can't, and they can't even see the hand in front of their face. Every life is defined by decisive moments. Every dream is defined by a decisive moment. And those moments of decision often dictate the course of decades. Listen to what I'm telling you. Those moments of decision, do I, don't I, will I, won't I, what should I do, what? And those moments of decision dictate the course for decades. If all of us, a lot of us, could sit and say, boy, I could go back to a defining moment. If I had not gotten that credit card, if I had not gotten that bank loan, if I had not gone out that night, if I had not done this, if I, you know the defining moment in your life. 
And if you had that second back, what decision would you make now? What decision would you make now? A decisive moment. If God is ordering our steps, this should not make me nervous. Psalms chapter 37, verse 31, the Bible said the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Let me go back. I don't know if you got it. If God is ordering your footsteps, then those milliseconds or those moments of decision should not make me nervous. If God is guiding my steps, it's more than, Lord, take control. It's more than, Lord, do what you want to with me. And then we go out and do something different. If he's guiding your steps, that means you're asking him on a continual basis, Lord, is this where you want me? Lord, is this how you would have me to go? Lord, is this the person you would have me to marry? Lord, is this not the person you would? Lord, what he is guiding my steps. And I'm hoping the Bible said those that are his would know his voice and a stranger they would not follow. If the law of God is in my heart, then none of my steps will slide. It's what the Bible said. If the law of God, let me get down to some pastoring here. If the law of God is in my heart, the Bible said, I just read it to you, then my feet are not going to slide. Because if the law of God is on the inside, what I put on the inside is going to manifest on the outside. And before I make a decision that's going to change the course of a church or is going to change the course of my life, I've already planted the law of God in my heart. Thus I trust he's not going to lead me in the wrong way. If ye being evil know how to good gifts, give good gifts, how much more does your Father in heaven? If I planted the law, I'm talking to you about dreams. If you planted the law of God into your heart, you don't have to worry about going the wrong way. I planted the law there. The Bible said my feet will not slip, shall not slide. So the opposite of that would be then... If I don't plan it, chances are I can miss it. It would be foolish. How many of you have gardens, plant flowers, all that stuff? We plant them and then we kill them at our house. They look good for about a week and then that's, that's all we got. They're dead. How foolish would it be, Brother Danny, to get your tractor, get out there, break up the ground, pull all the weeds out, and then they're standing at the edge of the garden and say, okay, corn, come up. Okay, tomatoes, let's go. How foolish would it be for you to break up the ground, stand there with your water hose, watering nothing you've put in the ground, And expecting your neighbor comes over because you know they all watch you. <laughs> Jesus. They all know what you're doing. Hey, I saw you till that garden. And I've been watching you. I didn't see you putting anything in the ground. What are you watering? Oh, the dirt. How foolish. How foolish is it then to come to church but not make application of the word of God in our life? How foolish is it to, to break the ground up but to not have planted anything behind that? The Bible said if I planted it there, it's in my heart, then my feet are not going to slide. My steps are not going to slide. There are defining moments in life and there are defining moments in the church as well. There are decisive moments. I personally happen to believe that this church is in a decisive moment. We are in 
Hey, just listen to me. Please don't think I'm talking to somebody else. You are here. I'm talking to us. We are in a decisive moment right now for our church. And if the answer is yes, onward we go. If the answer is no, then I don't know where we go. But I do know this. If we answer too early or if we answer too late, our decisions will affect the generations for thousands of generations to come should Jesus tarry. We are in in a time right now of an open heaven on our church and there must be a decision made by each person that can hear my voice are you in or are you out because we're going to affect generations to come from right now forward I know some of you will blow it off I know, I know it won't be listened to but listen to what I'm telling you we are in a decisive moment One wrong decision can affect generations to come. How many churches have had a window of opportunity? I think I told you, I know, in fact, I know I told you, but I'm going to tell you again. We were on vacation this past summer in Alabama. That's where, yeah, we were in Alabama at. Uh, Gulf Shores, and they were all napping. <laughs> Why do you go on vacation and take a nap? <laughs> I don't know. Jordan never naps, so therefore I'm up. I walk out on the porch thing that we've got there, swimming pool, she wants to go swimming. Guess who gets to go? I'm fine to go. So we go, we go down there. I'm sitting there on the side of the swimming pool. She's playing in the pool. I'm sitting there. This older gentleman walks down, sits down right across, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I just thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get you. And so we start talking and come to find out he was saved. It was probably me and him the only ones down there because the rest of them sure had the wrong kind of fruit. We're sitting there, I'm talking to this gentleman, we get to talk, and he asked me, you know, it's the same thing. Guys, the first thing they do is, hi, my name's Britt. You're, what do you do? <laughs> first thing we do, what do you do? So we're, we're trying to judge right then how much further we go in the conversation. Because if you can figure the fuel for the rocket that flies to NASA to go to the moon, I'm probably not talking to you very long. <laughs> Come on, I mean, I don't have much to say. <laughs> right? If you're a preacher or if you like to hunt or some other things, I got a whole lot to say. So he sits there and we get to talking and he says to me, he's been in the same church for 48 years. He's there because his mother was there. She was raised there. He's raised there. He's raised his kids there. And we get to talking. We're talking about church growth and the church in decline and all this kind of stuff. We're talking about all this. And he said, we just had our first visitors in our church in the last four years last Sunday. I've been in this church, he said, 48 years. We have no guests. We have no growth. We just had our first guest in our church two weeks ago. A family came to our church, he said. He get, continues to talk to me about what's going on. And it's because the church made a decision several years ago, previous years back. We're not spending money on outreach. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. We're not, we're not, we're not. And so they now have affected generations to come. Can, can you listen to me for a minute? We're in a moment of time in this church. I'll show you in a minute. Inaction is an action. 
in action is an action. To do nothing is an action. When we fail to take action knowing that something is there, knowing that, is a, that a dream is there, knowing that an opportunity is there, when we fail to take action, we forfeit the future. When we fail to take action on our dream, when we fail to take action on the things that we know there, we're forfeiting our future. Can I ask you something? When you think, when you sit on your back porch, when you're in your garden or when you're in the mall or wherever you are, what do you think about the future of this church? Do we think just till next Sunday? Are we hoping next Sunday somebody else preaches? Are we hoping next Sunday something happens? Are we, what do you think about this church? When we fail to take action, we are forfeiting our future. Every time you're able and you're not here, that is a vote to close and lock the doors. To fail to take action is to forfeit the future. And just as an inaction is action, indecision is a decision. I've got to make the decision. I'm talking to you about dreams. I've got to, you've got to make a decision about my dream. Do I, all even though all the odds are stacked against me, all the things, all the statistics say I can't do this, all the statistics say that this is going to happen in my family or in my life, do I give up or do I continue on? How many dreams have been given up on because somebody else said you couldn't do it? There has to be, there has to be a decision. An indecision is a decision. Let me ask you a question. What's the 500 pound line? If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. If you've read the scripture, you'll know some of what I'm talking about. What's the 500 pound line in your life? We're not here just to take up space and let time go by. I'm not here. You're not here just to take up the air, just to take up God's space. There's a reason. What is the 500-pound lion in your life? Anybody watch Shark Tank? It's okay to say you do. I watch it. I love it. I sit there and I think, man, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> do y'all? I mean, come on. A new lunch kit? I try to tell my kids about lunch kits. Lunch kits today are not lunch kits like they used to be. That's not a lunch kit. Whoa, man, a lunch kit was metal. It was metal. And it had this big lid on it. And had a thermos about the size of a two liter Coke bottle in the top of it. Come on, anybody had that, third, had that? Who still got it? I got one in my house. And, and you packed everything. You could get everything in that lunch kit. Six sandwiches. You could get all kinds. It's like carrying a suitcase to school. You had that lunch kit, man. You get to lunch. I'll be back in a minute. You get to lunch. And if you weren't paying attention and the little clasp had come undone while you were carrying it and you flopped that lid open at lunch, away your thermos went rolling across the table. Yeah. Woo, today they got. It's not a lunch kit. We're with Shark Tank. And, and they come, and I'm thinking, man, I wish I would have thought of that. And there's some people that will come in there and they have incredible ideas. And those folks with all that money will sit there and shred those people to pieces. I mean, I've seen some people come in there with wonderful ideas. I thought, man, that, I would use that. I would do that. I'm going to go find that. And people that sat there with billions of dollars and the opportunity to help someone, because listen, you weren't born with a billion dollars. You had to start somewhere and we'll sit there and shred people. How 
many people have shredded you for your dream. I've seen people walk out of the shark tank just bawling and crying, and I wish I could reach through the TV and tell them, you hold your head up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's your 500-pound lion? I'm going to get somewhere in a second. What's your 500-pound lion? Every one of us should have one. A dream. An impossibility. Even if it's just trying to reach your neighbor across the road to get them saved, that's a 500 pound line. So therefore all of us ought to have one of those. What's your dream in life? What are you chasing? Oh, pastor, I'm just too tired. I've given up on that. I've given up on a happy life. I've given up on a good marriage. I've given up on an education. I've given up on this. I've given up on that. And you know what? I'm just fine in by giving up. It's okay. In fact, I really would like for you to leave me alone about it. How many of us have just settled? When if God be for me and God's for me, he wants the best for me. What's your 500 pound lion? What's the 500 pound lion in this church? What's the impossibility of this church? Well, I can run you off a list of things at this point. One would be attendance. Let's just get faithful. Let's just come back to church. Primarily, our crowd last Sunday morning was our people. Let's just come to church. What's the 500 pound lion in this church? I can tell you what it is. It's the souls that are driving by right now that are lost. It's the people that you walk by in Walmart that still don't know Jesus. It's the crack addict that's trying to figure out tonight how to get their next fix. It's the person that just got abused. It's the person that's rich. It's the person that's sick. It's the person that doesn't know Jesus. It's the person that's backslid. That's the 500 pound lion. It's souls. Souls. How do we read that? The 500 pound life. No, it's whether I get my way or not. Guess what? I heard a preacher say one time, this ain't Burger King and you can't have it your way. I didn't say that. I don't know who said that. What's the 500 pound lion? If you listened this morning The 500 pound lion can be bitterness an impossibility for me to get by an impossibility for me to get past it an impossibility for me to move on it's an impossibility for me for, because of what happened to me because of what was done to me the 500 pound lion can be bitterness in your life you just cannot get past it I'll tell you there's a word from God this morning. What's the dream we are to be chasing? What's the impossibility? Man, when I was a student in school, I dreamed more than anything else. Boy, I thought I was going to be a baseball player. I thought, I, weigh, I mean, I weighed 75 pounds in the ninth grade, the summer of my ninth grade year. And I thought I was going to be in the NFL. I really did. You know why? Because my mother, we were watching the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Does anybody remember Danny White? The kicker for the Dallas Cowboys when I was about that tall. I, could, I wouldn't know him if he walked in this door right now. We were watching a Dallas football game one night and he kicked a field goal as a little kid 
And I remember we're sitting there watching that game and he kicked that field goal and it went through the uprights and I sat there to my mother and I said, boy, I wish I could do that. And she said, you can. I remember it just like it is right now. And I thought from then on, I'm going to be Danny White. I am going to be. I know that sounds stupid to you. What? And all these dreams, listen young people, all these dreams just pass away. Going to be a great singer? Can make a record? Oh, but they said I couldn't. Don't let they tell you you can. If God be for you, who can be against you? He's in the business of making the high place low and the crooked place straight. He has the ability. That is the business that he is in. I feel that. That is the business he is in. Is taking everything that somebody says can't happen and just to prove to you, just to prove to the arrogant people that he's in the business of taking the foolish things of God and turning it into a... Who would have ever thought Oh, snotty nose Gary Grisham would ever be a music pastor saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, had a dad like he had. And here's Pastor Gary today, anointed by God, two wonderful daughters, great grandchildren, questionable son in laws, but a wonderful wife. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. You better. Ooh, I know about those daughters, but those son-in-laws are questionable. You should have prayed a little longer, brother. But he did everything else right, and so did Miss Tammy. I, listen, don't stand up, okay? You sit down. We want her to stand up because she is the other half of this side. She is just as anointed. She is powerful. It's taken a lady like this all these years to get a man like this to the place that he is. So we take our hat off to the lady just like we do to the man. God knew what he was doing when he gave Gary Grisham Tammy. He knew what he was doing when he placed you here. He is not caught off guard by your mistakes. He's not caught off guard by where this church is at. We did not make a mistake. We are right smack dab in the middle of the will of God. Don't you let nobody tell you you can't be Danny White. Don't you let anybody tell you you can't be another Gary Grisham. When we were elected the pastor of this church, we went and told our family, told the girls, and, and one of the girls said, hey, I got a question. Is there anybody famous in that church? I said, yes, Gary Grisham and his wife. They are, they are. Our previous church, the reason she asked that was, the quarterback of the Texans went to our church prior to my getting there. <laughs> I want to warn you that on the way to your dreams, there are distractions that are there as well. You know that. Well, I'll tell you, in the world today that we live in, all the odds are stacked against us. Normally, a lot of times before we ever even get started. We have financial issues that are there. We have, I mean, just run a list off. There's a whole bunch of things there. There are distractions on the way to your dream. There are distractions on the way to the purpose of God in your life. But listen, I'm telling, talking to somebody. Those distractions are what's going to make you later on. Those distractions, those things, iron sharpens iron. Those distractions along the way are going to give you character. Those distractions along the way are going to give you maturity. They're going to give you. Those distractions are there at times to sharpen you and make you all the wiser for later on. Who would have ever thought we'd be paying $100 a board for old barn wood. $25 a sheet for some rusted tin. We're paying it. When you hung it, you never thought it would be of that value. Well, this is good, just came to me. 
You never thought it would be a value when you built that chicken coop, that chicken condominium all those years ago. Sean Money, my best friend in the world, called me the other day. He said, I'm headed to Lowe's in Van Buren. I'm coming by to get you. You're going with me. I, I mean, I, it felt like I didn't have any kind of decision to make here. I said, it's okay, okay, I'll go. He pulls up out here. I get in the truck. I said, what? Pray tell, do I have to go to Lowe's with you for? He said, I hope he, well, he watches this. He, and I said, what are we going to Lowe's for? Why the urgency? He said, last night I've been up all night long. He said, I've been thinking about building me a chicken condominium. He said, I'm going to build chickens. I'm going to have 25 chickens. He said, here's the diagram. He's up at 2 o'clock. Rode through the diagram out. I said, I stopped what I was doing to get in this car with you to go buy a chicken condominium for you to build. He said, I heard you've been preaching about dreams. He said, do you want to be a part of my dream or not? I said, sure, but I'm not coming to pluck chickens. I'm not coming to pick no eggs. Listen, somewhere along the way, you got to share in somebody else's dream before your dream will ever come to pass. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be bad times. But we cannot let what we cannot do keep us from doing what we can. We cannot let what we cannot do keep us from doing what we can. We cannot let what we cannot do keep us from doing what we can. What can you do today to build this church? Pastor, I can't preach, but you can invite somebody. Pastor, I can't teach, but you can share your testimony. Pastor, I can't rock a baby, but you can ask your neighbor to come to church. My Lord, that is good preaching. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. What can you do? That's just what you can do. We can't give up before we try. Some have never tried. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not evangelistic. How do you know? You've never invited anybody. I'm not a this. How do you know? You've never tried it. I found out along the way that if I would just step out, God would add an anointing. And with his anointing, anything is possible. I've done a whole lot of things. We just sold $8.25 million worth of profit. I'm not a realtor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. But I said, God, I want this church out of debt. Somebody's got to step out. And then the anointing came. And guess what? He lifted the pressure. You'll never know till you try. Just keep sitting in the boat, friends of Peter. Just keep sitting in the boat with all the other ignoramuses. I would love to have been there that day. And I would love to have think I would have turned to them and said, what are y'all going to do? You're telling me how to water walk and you're not even making any effort to stand up. How are we ever going to know until we try? How are you ever going to know you can teach a class until you try? How are you ever going to know that God can anoint you till you step out and try. Church I grew up in, we have, we have wonderful music and musicians. I appreciate every single one of them. Church I grew up in, we have wonderful musicians. Not one of them could read sheet music. Nobody. None of them could read a note. Am I telling the truth? Not one of them, we had a platform full of them, not one of them could read a note on a scale. Didn't know what it was. But if her daddy was the music pastor, her daddy would take them a CD and get them to listen to that CD for a few weeks. In a few weeks, they could play that music. I'm just telling you. 
is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Can't read a note on a page, but they're playing by sound. It was not their talent, it was the anointing. When they at least would try and step out, I can't read, I can't write, I don't know what a scale is, I don't know what an ABC, DFG, or upside down is. All I know is when I lay my fingers on these keys, something comes over me, and it's the anointing of God. Listen, it's not a matter of your education, baby. It's a matter if you try to step out of the boat or not. That is what matters. That's what matters. Man. How are we going to know unless we try? You're going to fall on your face. You may be right. But at least I'm not going to get caught sitting in the boat. At least I'm not going to get caught not trying. The worst thing to do for me is tell me I can't. Y'all know that? I have in my backyard, they built that pool, I don't know what for. And when they did, they put rocks around that pool, half as big as this piece of granite and as big as your car. And, and there's a bunch of them. And you know what that means? Does anybody here mow? It means extra added time when you weed eat. So I started thinking. <laughs> Thursday, I was on the lawnmower, and I'm riding the lawnmower, and I happened to look at those rocks and I thought, you idiot. You could save yourself a whole lot of time if you just get rid of the rocks. I just kept riding the lawnmower because I'm thinking, how am I going to get these rocks out of this yard? Can't get a tractor in this yard. I don't have no help. And this lawnmower can't move those rocks. The longer I mowed, the more I decided I'm moving these rocks today. Because <laughs> I'm not weeding around them one more time. I went and got my four-wheeler that has a winch on the front. Whew, praise God. Y'all guys know. Mm -hmm. Four-wheel drive, four-wheeler. You with me, Danny? Help me here with a winch on the front, and nobody's home but me. <laughs> nobody's there to tell me the yard, you gonna tear up the yard, nobody's there to tell me. But in my mind, this is how my mind works, I dreamed of her sitting on the porch telling me that I couldn't move those rocks. <laughs> Every one of those rocks are in my front yard right now. If you need a rock, come by and get it. I'll help you load it and get it out. How many times has the devil told you you can't and now you've just satisfied? I'm not telling you the devil told me, but I know it's a stupid story to you. I understand. But there wasn't no way in the world the sun was going to set Thursday till I had those rocks out of that yard. Because I decided I'm not weed eating around them one more time. A lot of my time is wasted. Weed eating, working around obstacles that can be moved. How much time is wasted in your life working around obstacles that can be moved? How much time is burned in your life? Because somebody put those rocks there. I promise Jesus did not do that. <laughs> somebody thought, whoo, these look so pretty. These are going to look so pretty and so nice. I'm, I know this is foolish, but, but you put things in your life that you think is going to look right. Is going to add to you. Is going to help you. 
And all it does is wind up costing you time, money. Here we go, and then I'm going to close. We have to be, and I'm talking to this church, as the sons of Issachar. Do you know who they are? You don't know who they are. It's in the Bible. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The Bible said the sons of Issachar had, who had, I'm sorry, the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We have to be in the middle of our dream, in the middle of your dream, you must be, now you know who they are, so now you're responsible more for knowing about them. You must be, we must be as the sons of Issachar. What does that mean? We must, just like the Bible said, they had an understanding of the time. That they should know what men, what Israel, we are spiritual Israel, Israel is the church, we are spiritual Israel. The sons of Issachar, the Bible said, had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That means the sons of Issachar had their finger on society during this time. They had their finger on the political movement during their time. The Bible said they had an understanding of the time. What the church lacks today is an understanding of the time. We are not in the leave it to beaver days. We are not in the Brady Bunch days. We are not in the 60s. We are not in the 70s. We're living in a day now where these kids worry if their student next sitting next to them is going to blow their head off or not. You never had to worry about that. We must have an understanding of the time if we do not I'm talking to this church we will affect the generations to come we cannot live off of yesterday's anointing we have to cultivate an anointing of our own for today, for now. I know you don't like it, and I know that you probably don't want to hear it. We may not want to hear what was this morning, but we must be as the sons of Issachar in the church. Whether you're five years old or you're 95 years old, we must get an understanding of the time. And if we don't, we will affect generations. I can't, my kids can't live on my stories. They're my stories. They're my experiences. As passionate as I am about them, and as well as I know the stories to them, I cannot force that experience on them. They have to have it for themselves. Please hear what I'm saying to you. I feel... The sons of Issachar understood the time and for what Israel should do. First Chronicles chapter 12. These guys had a handle on their society. They knew how to turn their ideas into strategies. They knew at that time, they knew their society. I sit and study what may be to some other people some ridiculous things. I study the statistics of this county. I study the statistics of the income of people in this county. I study the median ages in the homes. I study what's going on because I understand if we're going to be effective to this county and this city in the future, I must understand the time that we're in. Now listen, I know. And somebody come to the piano, please. And, and if I don't stop in a minute, just keep playing louder. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother would roll over in her grave if she knew some things today. Boy, my grandma would turn over in her grave if she knew that there was preachers that wouldn't preach on tithing, wouldn't preach on hell, and wouldn't preach on the Holy Ghost. Would, boy, she, she, I'm telling you, she'd get right in, she'd get in your face. 
I still believe in every one of those things. I preach on every one of those things. I live every one of those things. I practice every one of those things. The methods from reaching people when my grandmother was there to the methods of reaching people today have changed. The message is still the same. He still saves. It still takes the cross. It's still about the blood. It's still about the remission of sins. It will always be about that. It's about the Holy Ghost. And it's not just about the Holy Ghost. It's about the evidence of the Holy Ghost, which is speaking in other tongues. That is what it's about. But I must understand the time as to know what Israel ought to do. In your dream and chasing your dream, you've got to understand what time it is. Ecclesiastes, the Bible said, if I had time to read it all to you, it would say there's a time for everything under the sun. He runs a list off for everything under the sun. You've got to know what time it is, man. When I was young, I wanted, I wanted a big fancy truck. I wanted a four-wheeler. I wanted a hunting rifle. I wanted a house. I wanted this. I wanted that. And, 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 and my mama was still buying my blue jeans. <laughs> Come on, I almost said something different, all right? My mom's still buying my clothes here, and, and I'm wanting all this stuff. You gotta crawl before you walk, and you gotta walk before you run, and you gotta run before you can sprint. There's a process in this. You can't go from A to Z already. There's a whole bunch of letters along the way in the process. But the thing is, you gotta stay in the process. I'm moving forward. I'm not what I was yesterday. I'm not what I was five years ago. And be it to God, I'll not be any, I'll not be that today. Tomorrow I'll be more than what he. We need the book talked about, the book that we're reading or have read. It talks about contextual intelligence. I thought, man, those are two great words together. Contextual intelligence. What is contextual intelligence? I went and looked it up, and that is the ability to spot opportunity when others don't. Contextual intelligence is spotting an opportunity, seeing something that other folks don't see. That's why there's a movie or a show called Shark Tank. There's some people, they're bidding for somebody's attention because they saw something that had contextual intelligence. They saw something that somebody else did not see and they saw a better mousetrap on how to fix it so they here they are pitching it. We need contextual intelligence in the church to see things that other people don't see. That's your dream. Your dream is not the same as mine. My dream is not the same as yours. They may have the same relevance. They may have the same end goal, maybe whatever it is. But every single one of us have a different way to get there. Lion chasers seize the decisive moment. first generation, listen, the first generation could not see. So they cost the next generation 40 years of wandering around in the desert. Come on. They were all let go from bondage at the same time. They were all in Egypt. They were all in the same place. They were all, the gate opened for all of them at the same time. They all had the same promise when they all stepped out of the gate. But the first generation could not see it. So they cost the second generation 40 years before they were able to cross. Chasing your dream, there's a decisive moment. I can't stay in the boat with these people. If that's him, I gotta go. I can't let somebody else drag me down. I can't let somebody else keep me back. And I understand there are some that just don't get it. They don't get the idea of gifts. They don't get the idea of talents. They don't get the idea of serving. There are some that just don't get it. But what we must have is contextual intelligence. I gotta see what somebody else can see. Boy, here's the point I wanted to make all by. She's playing the piano, and here I am. 
What does this have to do with Eleazar? Keep playing. He is. I'm sorry, I didn't turn around. <laughs> That's why you all looked up when I said that. See, I know when something's wrong. I see it on you. I knew I'd done something. It took me a second to figure it out, but I, I have no contextual intelligence. I'm so sorry. What does all this have to do with Eleazar that we read about at the beginning? was a man who understood the time. One guy has just killed 800 people. He's standing there with them. They're listed in the three. And the Bible said Israel, the men of Israel retreated. They ran off. They run away. Eleazar stands there, the Bible said, and fought until his wrist was weary. I'm not the strongest man in the world, but I can tell you it's going to take a while before my wrist gets weary if we're going to fight. I guess that probably depends on how many people we're cutting at one time. But it's going to be a little while. The Bible said Eleazar stood there and he understood the time and he stood there and fought. The Bible said he stood there and fought until his hands stuck to his sword. That means this man understood what's going on and I am useful. The thing I have in my hand is the most useful thing right now and I'm going to stand here and I'm going to allow God to use me. What's in your hand tonight? What is it that's in your hand? Eleazar understood. This guy just killed 800. Now it's my time. And the Bible said he stood there and fought until his hand stuck to the sword. That's a long time. Now, I don't know why it's stuck. I have some ideas. If he's standing there fighting and we're killing folks, maybe it stood there and stuck because of the blood that's dried on his hand. Maybe other reasons. I don't know. But I think what the Bible's intending here is that he was so intent on answering the call of God in his life that he wasn't letting go of the opportunity that was at hand. let go of Pentecost we've let go of evangelism we've let go you used to could not pry Pentecost out of folks hand today we just handed it over yeah. 
Eleazar understood the time. Let me ask you this. Hand this back because when I did that, something just came to me. What did what he's holding, I don't, I don't know this, I had to study, it just came to me. What did what he was holding represent? It represented the anointing, it represented his life, it represented, it represented everything about him, it represented his heritage, it represented all of that. Here's what I want to ask you young people. Can we trust you to hand that over to you as you're coming behind us? But here's a question for you old people. Have we taught them how to use it? Have we efficiently taught them how to use and exemplify how to use what's going to be handed over to them. And if we have, can I trust you with it? Can I trust you with Pentecost? Can I trust that you're going to tithe? Can I trust you're going to be faithful when they elect a new pastor? Can I trust that you're going to be faithful when difficult times? Can I trust you're going to stay with your wife when you stand before God and you make a covenant before her? Can I trust you with what we're going to hand over? stood there and watched this guy kill 800 I don't think he had time to say now you gotta hold that sword just right and if you don't hold it right I mean you know and you gotta I mean you gotta stab him right in the right no the idea here is take it and swing baby swing swing baby swing Anybody remember Kodak? Any of you ever take the, the Polaroid? Well, you still got one? <laughs> Praise the Lord that we're past that. Do y'all know what a Polaroid is? I mean, you're like trying to capture moments. I mean, the kid's still doing something. You're like, and it's still on the one. And then when the picture comes out, it finally develops like 20 minutes later. 
you missed the whole point to begin with. Aren't you glad? Kodak in 1996 had 144,000 employees worth $28 billion. Was approached by large tech companies to sell some rights and move over and change their way and Kodak decided not to do it and guess what? They're bankrupt today. No money. Kodak is gone because they missed their decisive moment. They missed an opportunity. You have to stay focused. You gotta stay focused. Lord, thank you. Lord, I've tried to say tonight what I felt like you laid on my heart to say. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for dreams that you place in our hearts. Thank you for dreams you give us. I pray they'll all come to pass. Make the high place low and the crooked place straight. Help us, Lord. He said those of yours would know your voice and a stranger they wouldn't follow. Help us to be honest with ourselves tonight. With every head bowed and every eye is closed, please. Nobody's looking around. Who would just be honest tonight? I know it's Sunday night crowd and all that. I understand we're, we're going to go home. We're going home. But who would be honest and just say, Pastor, tonight I'm in a decisive moment and I need God's anointing and help in my life. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your hand. Somebody else. I'm. Thank you, ma'am. I'm in a decisive moment moment right now and I need the wisdom and knowledge of God to thank you to make the right thank you I need the right I need the, the wisdom and the knowledge of God right now to make the right decisions and the right choices that's me Pat thank you somebody else I'm in a decisive moment who would be honest to the next question and say and say pastor I am distracted right now and you fill in the blank by whatever pastor I'm just dealing with some distractions right now and I need to get these distractions out of my way and maybe you just say through the story that I told you there's some rocks in my yard I gotta get out of the way you lift your hand and say that's me thank you, thank you, thank you there's some rocks in my yard I gotta get out of the way if you raised your hand for any of those I want you to stand and come quickly don't wait one second come stand right here at the front of this church the front of this altar if you raised your hand come on somebody as soon as you get here and we can identify who you are there's going to be some people come behind you and it's going to pray for you. Pastor, I'm distracted. I got some rocks in my yard. I'm in a moment of decision. You see these people standing here. I want somebody to come. Please come. Pastor, I'm in the middle of my dream right now. I'm being distracted. 